Good morning and welcome to the morning service of First Presbyterian Church of Yazoo City. It is our pleasure to be here leading in worship. Of course, as you can tell, uh, Pastor Charlie Wingard is on vacation, and uh, we pray that he continues to enjoy his vacation and find good rest from that. Uh, but in the meantime, filling the pulpit this morning is Mr. Philip Holmes. He is a wonderful preacher, as we've had him before, as I'm sure you know. Please continue to welcome his wonderful family and to thank him for his service to us. I'd also like to thank you for continuing to try to physically distance and to wear your masks as is possible. We appreciate that. It's obviously difficult and can be inconvenient, but of course we're doing all that we can to protect one another, to protect our brothers and sisters. That's all that I have in way of announcement. So at this time, I would ask that we would all begin to prepare our hearts for worship. Would you now stand for the call to worship? O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Let us worship God. If you'll sing with me, hymn one, all people that on earth do dwell. Bless you. 
Pray with me. Our Lord, Almighty God, we come before you now and worship you. You are the self sufficient and self existent God. In Trinity, you are perfect, lacking in nothing. There is nothing that we could give to add to you. You are perfect and without flaw. And we are your creatures. You have crowned us with glory and made us in your very image. But Lord, we know we have sinned. We have fallen. We have sinned against your holy law. And so we come to you this morning confessing that we as your people have sinned against you. This morning we specifically confess that we are a people of unclean lips that by our speech and by our thoughts, we are condemned. We have spoken and delighted in lies. We have spoken and uttered gossip and deceit. We have also spoken words in anger, both to those whom we do not love and those that we do. And Lord, we have uttered impure speech, even blasphemy, blasphemy with our tongues. And so we confess that by this and by so much more, Lord, you know every one of our sins, they are not hidden from you, that we are deserving of your holy wrath, for you are holy and perfectly righteous and just. But this morning we come to you, drawing near to you, resting in Jesus Christ, who is our salvation. O oh Lord, his blood can make the foulest clean, we trust in that. So this morning we come to you, to your throne of grace, by his righteousness alone that is imputed to us. And so we desire to honor and to glorify you through him, asking that you might send your spirit to dwell within us and with us, to guide us in worship, to lift up our hearts away from this world and toward heaven, that we might worship you in spirit and in truth. This we ask, praying as Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Our scripture reading this morning for the Old Testament comes to us from Isaiah 
the 62nd chapter, Isaiah chapter 62, verses 1 through 12. As you will know from uh, several previous times going through Isaiah, the general context of Isaiah prophesying was to the divided kingdom, to the southern kingdom especially, in which he resided, but also to the northern kingdom. And the message of much of Isaiah's ministry was coming judgment. That because of Israel's unfaithfulness to the Lord their God, they were to be cast out of the land. Yet even still in the midst of a message of judgment, Isaiah shows very clearly that God was not done with his people. That God still had a plan to bring salvation to those whom he loved, to those whom he has set apart, his remnant, that he would be salvation to them. And so we find ourselves in this chapter, in the 62nd chapter, close, very close to the end of Isaiah's recorded prophesyings. And this chapter particularly points toward that salvation, to the salvation that God was planning and was bringing about for his people. And there are three things in particular about this passage that I want to point out and for us to notice. The first of them is the beauty and totality of God's redeeming work. You see, as God redeems a people for himself, he takes those who were once clothed in rags, who were poor, and now clothes them with the garments of salvation, with robes of righteousness. He gives them a new name from his own mouth and makes them righteous for his own sake, making them a crown of beauty, a royal diadem in his hand. Those who were once cold and wavering are made bright and shining in the Lord. Those who were meek and lonely are now exalted. Those who were once considered forsaken are now married, redeemed, sought out. Secondly, I want to see the certainty of God's redeeming work, the certainty, the rock-solid assurance that he will bring about his salvation. We see this in the very fact that the Lord swears by himself to bring this to pass, that by his right hand and his mighty arm, he will bring salvation to his people. There is no greater promise, for the Lord is the only thing that is sure in all the universe, and so we may trust in his promise. And thirdly and finally, the one who brings about God's redeeming work should especially be noted For it is said to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your salvation comes. His reward is with him. Who is the one who came to purchase his people? Who is the one who came to clothe his bride in robes of righteousness? Who is the one who came to purchase a people for himself by his own blood? It is Christ the Lord. And so now let us see him in this passage and in all of Scripture. Hear now God's word. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not be quiet until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory. And you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate. But you shall be called, My delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. On your walls, O Jerusalem, I have set watchmen. All the day and all the night they shall never be silent. You who put the Lord in remembrance, take no rest and give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes it a praise in the earth. The Lord has sworn by his right hand and by his mighty arm, I will not again give your grain to be food for your enemies, and foreigners shall not drink your wine for which you have labored, but those who garner it shall eat it and praise the Lord, and those who gather it shall drink it in the courts of my sanctuary. Go through, go through the gates, 
Prepare the way for the people. Build up, build up the highway, clear it of stones, lift up a signal over the peoples. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him, and they shall be called the holy people the redeemed of the Lord, and you shall be called sought out, a city not forsaken. May God bless the reading of his word, and let us pray. O Lord God, you are eternal. You are without beginning and without ending, which is a hard thing for us to grasp, but we delight in it. And there is no God beside you. Though the earth set up idols, they cannot speak, though they have mouths. They cannot see, though they have eyes. They cannot hear, though they have ears. O Lord, you alone are God. You alone hear our prayer. You alone are mighty. And we come knowing, as we have confessed our sins and our iniquities before you, they are many, but we delight to know that we have been ransomed, that we have been redeemed, that we have been married to Jesus Christ. We thank you that Jesus came. He took on flesh, dwelt among us, that your glory was revealed in him. We praise you and thank you that he knows our frame, that he was tempted in every way that we have been, yet without sin. And so he is our sympathetic and perfect high priest. We thank you not only is he our savior, the author of our salvation, but we thank you that he is king, that as he ascended, he now does sit up on the right hand of God the Father, and that he comes to judge that all are being made his footstool. O oh Lord, he reigns and rules, and we trust in that. We rejoice in Jesus Christ, our salvation. We come asking this morning as well that we would be a people marked by contentment, even in suffering. Make us to know more and more each day that the Christian life, that the life of following after the Lord is not one of ease or comfort, but it is one of dying to self, dying to sin, taking the cross, and following him. And so as we bear shame and affliction, as we bear trial and difficulty, we pray that you would grant us patience to endure, and that we might even rejoice in our suffering, that we would find delight and joy in it, knowing that through our suffering, you are producing in us steadfastness, that you are refining us, that we may be pure. Lord, whatever may come, whatever may pass, give us unceasing joy in the eternal hope that we have in Christ Jesus. And so we pray that many through the world would come to know that joy, that your light would shine in the darkness and those who dwell in darkness would see that light. Through especially Don and Claire Lee's Cobb, would you work that salvation? Bless them with a spiritual zeal to continue their work in France, that even in difficult and times where hindrances abound to the gospel ministry, we pray that you would provide funds for them, their daily bread, and that you would give them joy in all their labors. Continue the work of raising up young men both in France and all around the world who desire to learn from your word and desire to teach from your word. We pray also for Palmer's Home for Children that you would bless them as they seek to go about the business of protecting children, protecting little ones. We know your love for them. And so as they seek to care for the whole child, We ask that through their ministry, you would show the love and care of Christ for their souls. Through the work that they do, grow your kingdom, providing for them at every turn, giving them what they need, and showing grace through that work. We pray also for Lake and McConnell and Austin Bearden as they are engaged and preparing to be wed. Would you sanctify them, set them apart in this time, 
prepare them for the union that they are about to undergo, that you would be truly at the center of their relationship, and that they would be saturated in grace now and through the rest of their lives, forgiving one another and loving one another as they have been loved by you. We think also and pray for Eleanor and Jack Phillips as they're expecting. Keep both Eleanor and the child healthy. Uh, give them strength, Lord, and prepare them emotionally and in every way for what is to come. Help them to rejoice in the life that is to come. When this child is born also, we, we ask that you would raise them up in your word, that they would come to fear and to love you, to delight to fear you as Lord and God as Savior. We pray for those also who are ill and chronically so. We think of Sam Olden and Pease Graber. Father, would you be with Pease in his treatments, with his family, that they would support him, continue to help him and to raise his eyes to you. Pray for both of them that you would strengthen their bodies each day to rise, to worship you, and more than anything, whatever may come, lift up their hearts away from this world. Use suffering, use difficulty, use affliction and trial to cause them to lean upon Christ and to rest in the eternal hope that they have in him, that though this body may grow frail, that we will be renewed that by the Spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead, we also may be raised to eternal life by faith in him. Teach us this morning and each day to be a more thankful people, to recognize how bountifully you have blessed us, and so to give, not begrudgingly, but cheerfully. Would you be with Philip Holmes in this time? Bless him as he brings the word before us. Would you open our eyes through his words, speak by your spirit that he may preach with love, with joy, with conviction, with passion, with freedom. These things we ask, all in the mighty and precious name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. There we go. Um, a lot of things have changed since the last time I saw you guys. Um, nevertheless, uh, I'm grateful to be in the house of the Lord with the saints, and um, I'm very glad to be back here in Yazoo City uh, with First Pres. Uh, as a matter of fact, the last time I preached was in Yazoo, but I wasn't with you guys. I was actually across town with Second Press. Um, and it was right when everything got started. I think it was mid-March. Um, and that was after that, I think a lot of the church, after that particular Sunday, a lot of the churches uh, closed for a period. Um, so it's only appropriate that I'm back in Yazoo City again um, to share the word of God with you. This morning, our passage is Ephesians chapter uh, 4. We're going to be looking at verses 25 and 32. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 and 32. And my wife is here with me as well. She walked in and she walked back out. She has kids, um, so she's probably chasing one down the hallway. (laughs) Pray for her. Ephesians chapter 4. Verses 25 through 32. You'll find these words. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his hands, with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupt talk, corrupting talk, come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. Father, you are good. You are our provider. You are our protector. Your help in the time of trouble, your shelter in the midst of storms. Father, we praise you for all the good things that you do for us, Father, but most importantly, for just being God, because there's none like you, and there's no one beside you. Father, we confess that at times we have failed you. In many ways, we fail to walk in a manner that was worthy of the calling that we have received. We've lied. We've slandered. Father, we've cheated. We've been ungracious. We've broken your law in so many ways. But thanks be to you, our Father, for your Son, Christ Jesus who not only died for our sins, but was resurrected so that we might have life and have it more abundantly. So Father, we pray and ask that by your spirit, you would provide us and you would give us a word from you. We pray, Father, that you would guard me from error. Father, that your text that your scriptures will speak to us and that your spirit will enlighten our hearts and our minds so that we may hear your voice, repent of our sins, and walk 
in a manner worthy of the calling that we've received. Father, I pray for the unity, the body of Christ. I pray that you unite us one to another, that we may stand and that those on the outside may know that we are of you by our love one for another. Help us, we pray, and only, like only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. Our passage in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 through 32, it begins with a therefore. And any good Bible teacher at some point has probably told you that anytime you see the word therefore, you should probably go and look at what came before the therefore. So earlier in chapter 4, Paul urges us as Christians to walk in a manner of the calling, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which we've been called. He says that you can recognize people, you can recognize Christians, right, by the way that they walk, because this walk should have certain characteristics attached to it. So Paul says you should walk with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And then he goes on to talk about how there are certain doctrines that go along with maintaining this unity. He says it's one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. And though we are one, we're made up of many. And we've been giving grace according to the measure of Christ's gifts. God has called and given the church leaders with special gifts to equip the saints, why? For the work of ministry for the building up of the body. So in other words, these gifts that he's given to pastors, evangelists, apostles, and so on, he's given these things not for selfish gain. He's given us these things for the building up of the body, to foster unity and maturity among the saints. Paul explains that when each part is working properly, it makes the body grow and it builds itself up in love. And then in verse 17, he says, but to experience this, you have to make some radical changes within. But instead of starting with, you can't live the way that you used to, Paul says this. He says, you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. I always enjoy it when Paul and Jesus likewise did the same thing. He, he, he would always use the Gentiles, Gentiles as the other, right, as the opposite, to give us a model of this is what you do and this is what you don't do. And Paul does the same thing here. He says, no longer walk as Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. He says, we don't do what they do. We don't walk the way that they walk. Christians are not simply just good people. Christians are more than just, as this passage is going to point out and illustrate, we're, not, we're more than just law-abiding citizens. The laws of the land are too low for our standards. We've been called to something greater. So Paul says, you've got to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desire, desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self. So notice there's a transformation that happens. You're not just taking something off. You're putting on something new. He says, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. In our passage this morning, the Christian is given a picture of what it looks like to put off the old and to put on the new. 
A couple of brief observations that I think will help us understand the meaning of this passage. And there are two patterns that I want to point out in this text. First, Paul does something very interesting and that I, that I, I was very excited when I called it because you can kind of see the pattern going. And he's, he does this. He basically addresses our speech, our attitude, and then our actions. And then he does it again. He comes right back to speech, attitude, and actions. How often do we examine ourselves and other Christians through only one of those lenses, for better or for worse? Well, you know, I don't curse, right? Or, you know, I've never been drunk. Or I've never cheated on my wife, right? This is usually one. We like to, we like to take this. I, I, when it comes to my words, I'm good with protecting my words. Okay, but what about your actions? And maybe, maybe you got the two down packed. Maybe on the outside, right, your speech, right, sounds like that of a Christian. And your actions, right, look like that of a Christian. But what's going on internally? What's the posture of your heart? Why is it that you do what it is that you do? And it seems that Paul is trying to address and model that God cares about all three of these things. Your speech, right? He cares about your attitude. He cares about your heart motives. He also cares about what you do, your actions. And then Paul has another pattern in the passage. He provides a prohibition, an exhortation, and then he ends each one of these commands with some type of clause that explains or either provides motivation for the command. So you'll see this. And only one time he kind of breaks the pattern, he flips, he starts out uh, with a positive. But throughout this passage, he gives you a negative. Don't do this. Then he gives you a positive. Instead, do this. And then he explains why, or he gives you the motivator behind it. This model, I think, has many important implications when it comes to how we teach. When parents provide pro prohibitions for our little ones, it's important that we also exhort them with alternatives to replace the behavior. Furthermore, we should answer that famous why question, right? I think it's very important for us to think, think about this as Christians, right? As Christians, it is important that our children understand why, right? I'm four years into being a parent, and I'm telling you stuff that I did not necessarily understand or realize the importance of. I've learned more about being a parent from my wife than anything else, right? She's very intentional that when our son asks why, and he genuinely, genuinely wants to know why, she's very intentional about giving him an answer. And the answer is rooted in scripture. It's not just because I told you so. Now it gets to a point, right, where why, why? 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 Right? They're doing it more so to agitate you, right? It's not out of curiosity. Kids are uh, uh, very smart and they'll do anything to keep the conversation going, to, to not go to bed or to not eat their food. They want to put it off. But when they are genuinely asking why, as a matter of fact, they shouldn't even, even have the opportunity to ask why, you already, I, I just told you why, and you explain why. And parents, you should be able to do that, right? You have to learn how to do that. But I think even as, as pastors, as, as preachers, right, as teachers, when you prohibit something, right, because there, there are a lot of things right now. I, in, in the midst of the church, the reason why I think this passage is so important for the church, because the church is divided right now in many ways. And, and I think it, it's gotten worse because we got a lot of time on our hands, right? Coronavirus has slowed life down for many of us. So some of you have discovered Facebook and Twitter for the first time, right? New accounts have been popping up like never before. We're, we're spending more time on the internet. We're spending more time interacting. And oftentimes this is a place where we can be anonymous. 
And we can say what it is that we want to say. And I think this passage is going to address this because a lot of the stuff that I see among Christians, it grieves me. So it goes for not just what we say and what we do amongst each other in person, but it also goes to our behavior and our conduct on the Internet. Because there's just sometimes I see people on the Internet. I just want who's your pastor? Like, please, give, give me your session's number. Somebody, do you have a session? Are you a member of a church? Like, somebody needs to know how you, you're acting up. There's no way I could get away with some of the stuff that I see without my elders calling me on it. But this has become the norm. And we have a tendency to give prohibitions. And we skip exhortations because we think our prohibition is the ex exhortation. And instead of giving robust answers, we just say, because the gospel, right? Christians have to be deep thinkers. There's, there's a lot of concern in the church right now about, and I'm sure you've heard these two terms, cultural Marxism and intersexuality. And I think that there's good reason to be concerned about those things. I do think that they're actually threats that we need to talk about but guess what? Number one, we need to make sure that we understand what those things are, right? We need to make sure that as Christians, we are informed and we're not letting our favorite preacher, right, give us a buzzword that we can in turn take and use and weaponize against somebody who is not saying what we want them to say. Secondly, we need to, because all these things, systems, bad systems, good systems, so all systems and philosophies are used to solve a problem. They just don't do it very well when they're not rooted in scripture, right? So what we have to do, we have to go to the Bible to actually try to address the problem. We have to go to scripture to try to address the problem. And Paul models something right here. What he does is he says, hey, don't do that. Instead, here's the biblical approach. Here's the biblical framework. And then this is why. And he just doesn't give the Sunday school answer Jesus. Right? Because Jesus. He doesn't just proof text. He breaks it down. This is, this is what it means to be a good teacher. And all these things are pertinent. Because something begins to fester when we just start giving prohibitions in the church. And I think Paul, I think he's getting at all of that. Paul doesn't want to leave anyone confused. Paul doesn't want to leave anyone indifferent. And clearly also, he doesn't want to cause anger and division in the church. And I think that this pattern that he sets up here is important for us, right? If, if you find that there's division, confusion, and anger in the church, it's probably because somebody has either given a prohibition without an exhortation and an explanation, right? Because Guess what? When you tell your child not to do something and they ask you why and you say, because I said so, what happens? Right? You, you get it now, right? You, it's clicking. That's what happens. They get angry. They get frustrated. They want to know why. And scripture gives us why. So with these two patterns in front of me, Breaking down my three points proved to be challenging. I'm going to be honest with you. Preacher probably not supposed to do that, but I don't preach very much, so I'm just going to tell you. Because I was like, all right, speech, attitude, actions. Three points, easy. Well, that's a problem. Paul does speech, attitudes, action. And then he goes back to speech, attitudes, action, right? So the two passages about speech are separated. The two pas pas uh, passages about our attitude are separated. It's like, well, I've never done that before, and I don't think I should try it now. Like, trying to take this. I, I, don't, I, I want to see if I can preach this linear, right? Because it seems like there's a flow to Paul's argument that he's making, so we need to figure out what that flow is. And as I began to further reflect and meditate, the Lord was gracious, the Lord was kind, and these are the three points that actually came 
that is similar to the pattern in which Paul follows. So for my first point, I'm going to give you a prohibition that I think comes from this passage. And my second point, I'm going to give you an exhortation that I think also comes in this passage. And now my third point, I'm going to tell you why. And I think this, and I, and this, I'm not a biblical scholar, right? I'm just, I'm just a country pre- preacher from Pickens, Mississippi. So I can't say that this is what Paul was intending to do with these three points, the way that this passage was laid out. But I think that this is a helpful way to look at what Paul is doing. Because everything that I'm saying is going to be straight from uh, Paul's points. So number one, do not give the devil an opportunity to divide the body. That's my first point, straight from the passage. Y'all was nervous for a second, right? (laughs) You didn't know where I was about to go, right? Do not give the devil an opportunity to divide the body. Point two, unite the body by graciously sharing and giving help to anyone in need, right? So that's your exhortation. Prohibition, don't give the devil an opportunity to divide the body. Exhortation, unite the body by graciously sharing and giving, to, to giving help to anyone in need. And finally, point three, freely give good gifts as Christ has freely given to you. All right, that's the why, that's our motivator, all right? Point one, do not give the devil an opportunity to divide the body. So here's, here's this, this Paul's way of arguing this. First he says, having put off falsehood, that's our negative, right? That's, that's your prohibition. You've put off falsehood. Let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. Neighbor. All right, that's your exhortation. So you take off falsehood, right? Now I want you to speak the truth with his neighbor. Notice it doesn't say two, right? Because we, we can read that really quickly and assume that he's saying two. That's what I did at first. And then I came back to him and I was like, no, no, no. That's not what he's saying. He says, speak the truth with or among your neighbors. Then three. Freely, I'm sorry, and then three, why? For we are members one of another, right? So he says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to put off falsehood, continue doing that, having put off falsehood. I want you to speak the truth among or with your neighbors. Why, Paul? For we are members one of another. And then he goes and flips it, right? He starts out with an exhortation. He says, be angry. And then he comes back and he says, and do not sin. So that's your negative. You see how he flips those? Then why or how would be the usually, right? Because you, you want to, all right, Paul, you're telling us to be angry, but don't sin. Anger, the way it's oftentimes characterized in the Bible, is it can go both ways. And we're going to talk, we're going to unpack that. But right now, Paul doesn't begin with do not sin and be angry, right? Because that would be a miscommunication, right? That would give the wrong impression. Paul says, I can't got to flip that pattern for this one. Be angry, but do not sin. How, Paul? How do you, how do you, how, how is it possible to be angry and do not sin? Don't let the sun go down on your anger. So in other words, don't allow your anger to consume you. And then he says, give no opportunity to the devil. This interlude is often connected to command number two, right? Be angry, do not sin, and don't let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. But I think, being a country boy here, I think in the original language, it may connect all three verses, or at least all three. Yeah, 
three verses, 25, 26, and 27. And, th and this is why. So, so the evidence suggests that the word is correctly translated as the devil, right? That's the intention. So, so your, your translation, there's nothing wrong with your translation. However, the same Greek word used for devil is also used for slanderer or slanderous. It's the same word. It's hard for me to imagine that when Paul pins Diablos, he doesn't also have in mind both the father of slander and slandering, right? He's not just saying, give no opportunity to the devil, because he could have just said, give no opportunity to Satan. But he chose to use the word devil here, which, has, which, which means more than one thing. And in the context, it's probably translated as devil, but I think he also is trying to bring to mind to his readers slandering. Now remember what I just told you early on in the passage, right? Speak truth with his neighbor, not to. So it seems like Paul was concerned about the types of speech, right? The words, the truthness, the truthfulness of the words that are coming out of our mouths when we are among one, one another. When I initially read this, I assumed that Paul was saying, you need to speak the truth to your neighbor. So if your neighbor is doing something wrong, you need to tell them the truth, right? Uh, that's not what Paul, I think, is getting at here. He says, you've put away falsehood. And notice, this is in the context of uniting the body. And what divides the body more than lying among your neighbors and doing it out of anger, which is essentially slander, right? You see how Paul's connecting this? So, so it seems to me that when Paul is saying, speak the truth with your neighbor, his concern is for how we talk. And then he knows that oftentimes when we're lying or when we're slandering one another, right? What's typically happened is because we're angry at somebody. And we've allowed that anger, whether it was justified or not, when it began, we've allowed it to consume us. Therefore, we have given opportunity to the devil to divide the body. It all works. It's all there. So, so Paul, Paul, Paul knows what's going on. He, he knows the patterns. He knows what, what the Gentiles do. And he's trying to get them to see, no, 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 no. We don't do that. You're different. I know that's what y'all used to do before you came into the body of Christ, but as Christians, we're called to something different. We have to put off falsehood. We have to speak truth among each other. And we have to watch our anger because if it consumes us, it will give an opportunity to the devil that will lead to us slandering and lying and ultimately dividing the body. Two, unite the body by graciously sharing and giving help to anyone in need. Paul, Paul switches now to the thief. He says again, this pattern, I, I love this pattern, guys, I'm not gonna lie, I just, I love the way he does this. <laughs> Let the thief no longer steal. Don't do this. But rather let him labor doing honest work with his hands. But do this, right? So that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Huh. Here's the reason behind it. So, I think it's very important for us to point out that when it comes to the standards of the world, as we mentioned earlier, God's standards for his church and for his people are different. In other words, it's not enough to stop stealing, right? 
just because you don't steal doesn't make you a good person. Right? That's very important for us to like let that sink in. You not stealing doesn't make you a good Christian. It does not mean that you're necessarily walking in the manner in which you've been called. First of all, you need to work. But it's not just enough for you to work, right? Because there are a lot of people who work, but they work dishonestly, right? Drug dealers, right? People who, who embezzle money, they work, they work. But it's not honest. They're stealing. Well, so I guess that wouldn't work, but there are, other, there are plenty of things that you can do that are not legal and that are not honest, right? And Paul says, no, you got to do more than just stop, than just, uh, than just simply stopping um, stealing. You need to do something. You need to work, and it needs to be honest work with your own hands. But he doesn't stop there, and this is what makes Christianity so radical. This is what makes the change that he's calling to, calling us to so radical. Because many of us, oftentimes, I think that we would probably, in the, in the church, I get it, right? Because churches have, in the past, and you see it, and they're on TV now, right? They, they swindle people, right? They're, 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 they're trying to take advantage. They, they want your money. Um, they're, 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 they're peddling the gospel. And I, and I, and I, I I wonder if oftentimes when we think about good, honest, hardworking people, right? I think oftentimes Christians don't, don't go far enough. Because oftentimes, especially in the South, we'll stop with, well, he has a job, he works really hard, and he's making an honest living. And he's a good, that's a good man, right? That's a, that's, a, that's a good one. That's a good fellow. That's a good family. Paul says, no, no, no. We got we to go further. That's, that's not enough for the Christian. He says, so that he may have something to share. The whole purpose, the way Paul is arguing here, right? It's number one for you to be self-sustaining, right? To be able to take care of yourself. But Paul doesn't even mention that part. He knows you got that part. He's not, he's not concerned about that. He knows that you're going to spend your money on yourself. He's saying what I know that it might not be your reaction to do is to give it and to share it. And look, he emphasizes that. And I, I just, I'm reading this and I'm just like, just so, so many things about this text are just so helpful for us to remember as Christians. Because I think sometimes the church, in a lot of ways, in our thinking, we've been secularized. Right? If the world affirms or thinks that it's good enough, we accept it as good enough. And Paul is saying, no, we don't do what the Gentiles do. I mean, it's good that they work. It's good, maybe, if they're not stealing. It's good that they're doing it honestly. But if you think that that's enough, you don't understand Christianity. He says, you've got to go further. He says, you give so that you can share with anyone who is in need. And then he transitions back to the way that we talk. He says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as it fits the occasion. So, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth. That's your prohibition. But only as is good for building up as fit the occasion. That's your exhortation. Why, Paul? That it may give grace to those who hear. So, the first time he said don't lie. Right? When you're among your neighbors, speak the truth. Speak the truth with your neighbors. But guess what? This passage is going further. It's not enough to just speak the truth. Right? Because if, you know, 
Nancy and Walter are having marriage problems and one of them tells you in confidence and you share that with somebody else in the church that's not supposed to know. It's the truth. But is it corrupt? I think so. Right? Paul knows the human heart. Because we're always looking for loopholes. Right? Well, technically, I mean, is it gossiping? Right? Like, I mean, what is gossiping? Paul says, is it good for the building up of the body? Is it giving grace to those that hear? But, but it was true. Is it good for the building up of the body? And is it giving grace to those that hear? Or if they're true, it can still be corrupt. Our words should build up. <clears throat> Rather than tear down, tear down. Our words give grace, comfort, advice, and everything else that aids in the salvation, in the building up of the body. Like it seems as if Paul has moved, moved on from unity, but he hasn't, right? He, he's, he's addressing the sins that he knows can cause division and oftentimes cause division in the church. And he says, I know that you thought that these things were okay because perhaps you had put off falsehood and you were speaking truth, but your speech was still corrupt. And your intention was not to love, your intention was to uh, tear down or entertain perhaps even at the expense of someone else. And perhaps your anger started out in a way that was justified, right? I can tell you right now, if somebody came up here and open hand slapped me, I'm probably gonna get angry. Paul says, don't let that anger consume you, right? And this is what I love about, this is, this is how, there are things like this that point out, that, that illuminate the divine, the, the divineness of, of God's word, right? Because if this was not, like, of God, it, it would give you some type of ridiculous, impossible rule, like, don't get angry. There's also a righteous type of anger, right? When we see injustice, when we see sin on display, it should grieve us. And usually when we're a direct um, victim of it, it angers us. And the Bible is simply saying, there's a such thing as a righteous anger. Ang sin should make you angry, angry. But don't let it consume you because it leads to a very nasty place and it gives Satan an opportunity. And then Paul does something else in this passage as we continue moving down. He says this, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now, give no opportunity to the devil, right? There's no comma after that. Right? Don't give the devil anything. Don't give him an opportunity. And, the, and, and, and with, with the period being right there, especially in light of what Paul does down here, it implies because he hasn't done anything for you. He has nothing good for you. Don't give him an opportunity, period. Now, he comes down and he says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't give him an opportunity. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit, comma, by whom you were sealed 
for the day of redemption. There's nothing good for you. There's, there's, there's nothing, nothing's good going to come about when you give Satan an opportunity, when you give him a foothold. But the Holy Spirit, why would you want to grieve him? Calvin writes this. He says, as the Holy Spirit dwells in us, to him every part of our soul and, our, and of our body ought to be devoted. But if we give ourselves up to all that is impure, we may be said to drive him away from making his abode with, with us. And to express this still more familiarly, human affections such as gr joy, grief, are ascribed to the Holy Spirit. Endeavor that the Holy Spirit may dwell cheerfully with you as in a pleasant and joyful dwelling and give him no occasion for grief. You see that nod that he, he does, right? Give Satan no opportunity, but give the Holy Spirit no occasion for grief. Calvin continues, he says, as God has sealed us by his spirit, we grieve him when we do not follow his guidance, but pollute ourselves by wicked passions. No language can adequately express this solemn truth that the Holy Spirit rejoices and is glad on our account when we are, when we are obedient to him in all things and neither think nor speak anything but what is pure and holy. And on the other hand, is grieved when we admit anything in our minds that is unworthy of our calling. When we pollute ourselves with anger, lying, selfishness, and corrupt speech, we give the devil an opportunity. And we grieve the Holy Spirit. Listen, lying, anger, selfishness, corrupt speech, all of these things divide the body. And we cannot live by the Spirit if we are grieving the Spirit. See how that works? Why is it, you know, like why, why, why does it seem my church is being divided? Why does it feel like the Spirit of God isn't among us? Possibly you got a church full of lying, slandering, angry, corrupt people. You need to repent. Why is our marriage broken? Why, why can't we figure it out? I'm just throwing that out there. It's possible. Your house is full of liars, angry folk who are slandering each other. Why is there division among us? These are, these are the things that we have to ask ourselves. We have to examine ourselves through these lenses. Finally, Paul says, with all bitterness and wrath to point three. Freely give good gifts as Christ has freely given to you. With all bitterness, wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. That's just like the junk drawer right there. All of it. If I left something out, all of it. That's, that's your prohibition. Instead, those are my words. He says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. That's your positive. Here's the explanation. As God in Christ forgave you. Now, a few observations as we close. It seems that Paul is summarizing everything that he's just said before this passage. So, so the rest of our passage just is kind of like the summary of it. 
He says, put away all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, malice, right? So bitterness, wrath, and anger all have similar meanings, right? There's some overlaps. Only anger is described as an appropriate response for Christians when it's righteous anger, right? Because it can go from righteous to wicked anger. If, it, if we allow it to fester, if we allow it to hang around, it's, it's, like, it's like bad milk, right? It's, it spoils over time, right? You, you don't stay angry for a long time and that anger doesn't go from righteous anger to something that's corrupt and wicked. Also, righteous anger, righteous wrath and anger are attributed to God. Throughout the Bible, we always see that God's wrath, right? God's wrath is righteous. God's anger is righteous. Bitterness is never considered, considered righteous in the scripture. So in the, in, you can find be angry, right, in our passage. And you can find a host of texts that talk about the wrath of God and, and how God was angry and that angry, anger was righteous. But you'll never find bitter presented in a positive light anywhere in scripture. And that malice refers to wickedness in general, which I think also includes theft as well. Here's what I think connects all of the, this entire passage together, because there's, a thing, there's another thing that I didn't mention, but perhaps you called it. This passage is about giving, right? Give no opportunity to the devil. Give to one another, share, right? Give good gifts to one another. So whether it's your speech, Right? And I even think that he may have brought the thief in for multiple reasons, but I think one reason is so that he can just oppose what it means to give good physical things, right? Versus what it means to do the opposite of that. And the direct opposite of that of giving good physical things is taking physical things from someone, right? So it seems to me that Paul used the thief to point out that, hey, don't steal, give good gifts. And then finally here, the word that's used in our text which is, I think, again, the right way to translate it is forgiveness. However, when you look up that word in the Greek, the word also means to give freely as a favor, to give graciously. So it wouldn't be too far-fetched, right? Probably get some points taken off if I did this in, in being glass, Greek class, but I think it wouldn't be too far-fetched especially in the context of this passage, to say that be kind to one another, tenderhearted, giving. Giving graciously to one another as Christ has freely given to you. It still means the same thing. And if you look at that in this text, there's, there's this pattern of giving. The only person that you're not supposed to give to is the devil. Don't give them any opportunities. But when it comes to the body of Christ, you need to be a giver. You need to share what you have. In order to share, you're going to have to work. You're going to have to work honestly. And you've got to stop stealing, right? Robin Hood, it's not cool in the church, right? You give to, to steal from the rich, to give to the poor, right? And there's a, you know, you can talk a whole lot about like, yeah, not even going to go there. My point is... <laughs> When it comes to the Christian church, we are to be givers, especially to those in the body of Christ. And in the context of this passage, I think he is talking about within the church. There are other passages we can go to about loving your neighbor and helping those that you encounter. But I think in this passage, he's talking about taking care of those who are in the body of Christ. If you see someone that needs help, whether it's, whether, if they need an encouraging word, it is your duty as a Christian to encourage them. If they need food, talk is not enough. The Bible says no. You also need to give them food. Why? There is nothing that we have that has not been given to us. Everything that we have is from God. And he has given us a special gift in his son, Christ Jesus, 
who freely gave to us all things. He gave us the best gift in the world in forgiveness. By pardoning us for the way that we disobey God's law. And not only that, he stood in our place. And he said, you know what, they're guilty. But I'm going to take the punishment. We have no right to be wrathful, to be people of anger and bitterness. When we escaped the wrath of God and the anger of God, because his son freely gave us the gift of sonship, the gift of eternal life that we can now call him, not judge, but father. As we close, don't give the devil an opportunity to divide the body. Unite the body by graciously sharing and giving aid, comfort, and advice and love to anyone in need, especially the saints. Why, Philip? Because Christ has freely given good gifts to all of us. And that is our motivator. And that is our, our why to why we love Christians and why we make sacrifices and why we avoid doing anything that's going to harm. And when we do harm and when we do sin, we repent. And when we're sinned against, we don't stay angry, we forgive. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. I pray that it would be a blessing to your people. And I pray that we would abandon the sin. That we would not give Satan a foothold or an opportunity to use us to divide the body. Pray that we would be givers, that we would give good gifts in word and in deed, that the body would stand united, and that Christ, who has freely given us all things, glorify and what we say and what we do. Amen. Let us respond to the word by standing and singing him 335. Gracious spirit, dwell with me. Thy life in mine revealed.
Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. and see.